aby porozmawiać o europejskim strajku farmerów, o protestach rolników w całej Europie Ralf Scholhammer. Naukowiec, politolog, człowiek, który bada od lat sprawy energetyki Zielonego Ładu i którego teksty można czytać w każdym interesującym miejscu na świecie, gdzie debatuje się o tych sprawach. Ralf, witamy w Telewizji Republika. Dziękujemy za spotkanie. Ralph. Rozmawialiśmy wielokrotnie i wielokrotnie pytałem Cię o kwestie dotyczące polityki ekologicznej, polityki zero emisji, polityki, która wygląda na nakładaną przez Europę na samą siebie politykę samobójczą, politykę podatkową, której efektem jest zmniejszanie możliwości przemysłowych, ekonomicznych Europy. Pisałeś o tym i mówiłeś o tym wielokrotnie. Ale coś, co oglądamy w tej chwili, kiedy rozmawiamy, w Europie trwa strajk rolników w wielu różnych miejscach. I choć powody w szczegółach różnią się pomiędzy państwami, to jednak elementem wspólnym jest właśnie owa zielona polityka. Czy jesteś zaskoczony skalą tego protestu? similar. The, the farmers, like in Poland, have different issues with their government than the farmers in Germany, uh, than the farmers in France, and now increasingly also the farmers in Britain. But what ties it all together, I think, is a sense, and this is why so many people are interested in it and are supporting it, they sense that this is an opportunity to express their dissatisfaction in a way they couldn't do it in uh, recent years. So a lot of this is the Green New Deal is kind of one overarching theme, but I think it's more than that. It's the sense that the bureaucracy in Brussels and very often also the bureaucracies in national governments, that they no longer serve the primary interests of the people, right? Whether it's energy policy, whether it's migration policy, uh, whether it's uh, agricultural policy. And I think this all gets now bundled together in the farmers' protests that serve as an expression, as a pressure valve, if you want, uh, of the dissatisfaction of the people. So the, 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 you know, the, the elites, if you want, and I'm careful with this term, in Brussels, in London, in Berlin, like they have to be very careful because this is no longer just a farming issue. That was the beginning. But now you can see like more and more and more other movements latch onto this. I mean, there is, we talked about this shortly before the show, there is the impression, justifiably so, there are some people in Europe who have massive representation even though they're not necessarily particularly popular with the people. For example, the ideology of the Green parties is massively overrepresented in Brussels, whereas the ideology, for example, let's say, of the industrial heart, of the working class, is massively underrepresented. And they kind of find themselves in these farmer movements. Whether the, farm, the farmers themselves are happy about this remains to be seen, but I think this is where the journey is going. Rob, let, let me stop here for a second, because... Pozwól, że zatrzymamy się tutaj na moment, bo nie pomyślałem o tym nigdy wcześniej, ale kiedy to powiedziałeś, to w zasadzie wydaje się oczywiste. Jeśli spojrzeć na kwestię medialnego nasycenia, no to w zasadzie partie zielone, partie ekologiczne powinny rządzić w każdym albo prawie każdym państwie europejskim, sądząc o tym, jak dużo mówią na ten temat politycy mainstreamu. Ale z drugiej strony, kiedy patrzymy na partie zielone, a jest ich trochę w Europie, no to bardzo trudno jest znaleźć państwa, w których one rządzą. No, częścią koalicji rządzącej w Niemczech jest ta partia, ale to jest raczej sytuacja rzadka. No więc jeśli spojrzymy na to nasycenie medialne ideologii ekologicznej i zestawimy to z liczbą partii eko, zielonych, które faktycznie rządzą, no to jedno nie pasuje do drugiego. Jaka jest tego przyczyna? Look at look at it from this perspective. You are absolutely correct. So, in, and this is particularly true for Western Europe. 
So if you look at the overall election results, right, the Green parties are somewhere usually between 9 and 15 percent. But now let's look at how represented is the Green Party, for example, among journalists. There it's all of a sudden 50 percent. How represented are they among, uh, you know, academics in the university settings? There it's, you know, 60, 70 percent. How represented are they in the cultural class, like, you know, entertainment, popular culture? There it's also significantly over 50 percent. The Green Party and their ideology, like, they don't have the masses behind them, but they have all the cultural um, society institutions behind them because they were, as the famous saying goes, they were marching through the institutions. The big problem that the working class and let's say the center-right parties had and still have, they believe, you know, every four or five years there is an election, we stand for election, hopefully we win. Whereas the left always said, oh, elections are just one part of the picture, right? That's one battle in a larger war. So they made sure that they control the media, that they control the cultural institutions, that they control the universities. And they were successful. And now we see, as you correctly described it, we see their oversized, their entirely outsized influence when it comes to policy and decision making. I mean, it's absurd. Look at Ursula von der Leyen. Ursula von der Leyen on paper is a member of the German Conservative Party. But look at her priorities. Look at the way in which she was running the EU Commission. Um, she was in name a conservative, but in action, she was definitely more closer to the Greens than she was to anything else. For example, just for your viewers, she was speaking at a degrowth conference in the summer of last year, which is, of course, completely absurd for a supposedly free market, um, you know, conservative party. And we see this in other areas as well. The European conservatives are now backtracking a little bit, right? They're more critical now of the Green New Deal, but I think that's particularly because we have elections in June. I'm not sure if they will remember their criticisms the week after the after the elections actually took place. Actually, what, what are your predictions regarding the... Swoją drogą jestem ciekaw twoich przewidywań. Jesteśmy przed wyborami do Parlamentu Europejskiego i kiedy rozmawiam z politykami, z członkami Parlamentu Europejskiego, konserwatystami, pytam ich o te wybory, to przebija z nich swego rodzaju nadzieja, że w tych wyborach uda się zmienić sytuację polityczną w Parlamencie Europejskim. Jestem ciekaw, czy podzielasz ten optymizm. Ja chciałbym go podzielać, sam jestem konserwatystą. Ale szczerze mówiąc słyszałem już tego rodzaju zapewnienia wielokrotnie i to się do tej pory nie zdarzyło. Czy twoim zdaniem sytuacja, protesty takie jak te mogą w rzeczywistości spowodować, że w parlamencie europejskim nastąpi zmiana władzy, że nie będzie możliwe powołanie nowej Komisji Europejskiej bez zgody partii konserwatywnych, biorąc również pod uwagę wszystkie rodzaje podziałów, różnic pomiędzy tymi partiami w Europie. Ale czy to twoim zdaniem jest możliwe, czy to perspektywa realna? Well, I think it's certainly possible, but you, I think, touched on the most important topic. There's a difference between someone being in office and someone being in power. So it's absolutely possible that you have this right to shift in June and that certain offices will change who is actually holding these offices. But you must understand, and of course you know this, but also for your viewers, the EU is, is primarily a bureaucratic apparatus. So a lot of what's going on there is not decided in the European Parliament. A lot of this is decided within the European bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy is, of course, hard left leaning. So what would be needed, I'm using this expression very carefully, so don't get me wrong, but basically you would have to purge the European bureaucracy and replace many of those bureaucrats with more conser conservative members and more conservative individuals. And I think that is going to be a very, very difficult process because what we see now in the, you know, the kind of new green, green new dealish uh, direction of the, of the EU, this has been built up over decades. And kind of to reverse this, this is going to be, I'm not saying it's impossible, but this is going to be a very, very long and a very, very tough fight. Well, I have very strong hopes uh, on the Eastern Europeans. I think there is a schism, a division in Europe between Western Europe and, let's say, Central Eastern Europe. And I think the future of Europe lies within Central and Eastern Europe. By the way, in addition to the European Union, I was hoping that somebody from Poland would throw their hat in the ring as the new Na Secretary General of NATO. I think that would be a very strong sign. And by the way, I think it would also be deserved. I think the Eastern Europeans 
have to make much clearer that they want to play a more significant and stronger role within European, but also within global institutions. And let's be completely honest, I think they deserve it, right? Uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, the Czech Republic have done a fantastic job. The, Visi the Visegrad group has done a fantastic job, despite certain differences. I know not everything is perfectly well between Hungary and Poland at the moment, but I think that's just a rough patch that's going to change over, over time. But I yeah, think the, they, the, that's that's yeah. actually very interesting. But uh, Cóż, widzieliśmy trwały już kilkukrotnie próby przeprowadzenia kampanii na te stanowiska. To to feel this position or similar position by different politicians from this part. Jednak patrząc na to, jak wielkie interesy, geopolityczne interesy pomiędzy Stanami Zjednoczonymi, Europą, Rosją, Niemcami, Chinami, wielkimi państwami tej części świata regulują sprawy polityk w tych dziedzinach, to jednak chyba nie sekretarz generalny NATO, to nie wysoki przedstawiciel Unii Europejskiej do spraw międzynarodowych, czy dyskutowany przedstawiciel do spraw obrony są miejscami i urzędami, w których podejmowane są realne decyzje. Defense. Those are not the things and the places where the real decisions are, are being made. Uh, so it's more symbolic, uh, however, very interesting. But I wanted to, 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 to touch upon the the issue that you that, that you actually raised here. The uh, because what you said. Ale skoro wspomniałeś o tej sprawie, czy to oznacza, że jeśli tak dużą władzę posiadają te niższe rangi urzędników w instytucjach unijnych, takich jak Komisja Europejska i inne tego rodzaju miejsca, czy wykształciła się w Europie, czy w Europie wykształcił się swego rodzaju deep state, głębokie państwo, taka struktura niewybieralna, a de facto rządząca sprawami europejskimi? Deep state? inside European Commission, inside those institutions? Oh, absolutely. I mean, to be clear, I wouldn't even call it, even though I like the expression, but I wouldn't call it a deep state. You must think at it from this perspective. Every organization, your organization, the organization I work for, right, has a certain organizational culture. There are certain views within a company, within a, within a club, within an association that dominate. And the same is true within the European Union as well. And that organizational culture tends to lean towards the left. So there is a natural inclination for those who are members of the bureaucracy to kind of block everything that they perceive as coming from the right and support everything that they perceive as coming from the left. But I don't think it, it can on occasion, I'm not, you know, we see this in the United States, it can take on almost conspiratorial qualities. But very often I don't think this is not necessarily what drives it. It's just people who believe that the right is tremendously dangerous and the left got it all right and in order to prevent whatever catastrophe they believe might happen, right, they have to block whatever could come from everything that's even so slightly right of center. And this is, of course, in a sense, also why the European Union was created. I mean, I always say this ironically, but I mean it in, in parts, right, the European Union was created as a kind of a straitjacket for the darker impulses of the European people. The idea was once you have the European Union and once you have that bureaucracy, that supranational bureaucracy in Brussels, right, fascism, nationalism, um, whatever you, you name it, right, can no longer, can never kind of rise again because we have then this, this, this bureaucratic force that simply will damp it out whenever, whenever it should become a possibility. But I think now we have reached a point where the cure is becoming uh, the disease. And what I mean by this is if you look in certain areas, how the European Union, how Brussels behaves, it is very authoritarian. It is quasi-imperialistic. And what I mean by this is if the EU steps up and says, if certain countries like Hungary, like Poland, do not act as we want them to act, for example, we withhold funds, that's how the imperial center acts towards the periphery. This is not how a partnership or a union between equals would act. And I find that very worrisome. Ralph, uh Wspomniałeś o marszu przez instytucję Gramsciego, no ale z tego, co mówisz, wynika, że ten marsz okazał się dużo bardziej skuteczny niż pewnie sam Gramsci przewidział w przeszłości. Oh yeah, I mean this this is uh, something I believe where the the left um, has been smarter than the right because for the left, by the way, we see this in all areas even nowadays. On the right, we talk about, you know, we talk about environmentalism as one issue. We talk about transgenderism as one issue. We talk about foreign policy as one issue. For the left, all of this is a broader issue, is one large war that they are fighting. 
Um, and this is, I think, why the right loses so often. We fight individual battles and they fight a broader war. And I think that gives that we saw it in relation to Israel, for example, right? This is all part and parcel of their larger worldview. And I think this is whether we, we are like the, the outcome of this, that's a separate topic. But as a strategy, I think this was very successful. And to be quite honest, as you correctly pointed out, the left was always honest about this. Uh, yeah. I find it uh, these days very absurd that look at the, you know, the migration question. Right? It's, it's everybody is now like, oh, how could that happen? How was that possible? But they've been telling us yeah. this for decades. That's true. They, they actually, it was. W zasadzie nie ukrywają tego do teraz, a co ciekawsze, nawet udało się im spowodować, że partie, które nie są partiami lewicowymi, przejmują tę lewicową agendę. Przykładów jest cała masa europejska partia ludowa i inne partie, które nazywają nazywają się partiami konserwatywnymi, no te lewicowe elementy swojej strategii politycznej dziś prezentują szeroko. Ostatnie pytanie. Rozmawiamy dzisiaj bardzo dużo o prawicy, lewicy, o tym, w jaki sposób środowiska konserwatywne patrzą na trwający strajk rolników, ale ja nie mam wrażenia, żeby ludzie, którzy wyjeżdżają w całej Europie na drogi, blokują i rolnicy byli ludźmi o poglądach prawicowych. Choć cały ten protest tak właśnie jest portretowany. Jak na to patrzysz? No bo to jest rzecz niezwykle ciekawa. Rolnicy nie są po prostu konserwatystami, prawicową partią. No a mimo wszystko z tej perspektywy rzecz jest portretowana i opisywana przez media głównego nurtu. Well, I think this is just the usual media reaction. And I think this is, if we just take Germany as an example, there is this weird confusion that when people demonstrate or protest against the government, that they are protesting against democracy or against the state. Because that's another problem uh, I think that the left has. They believe that they're entitled to rule, that they're entitled to govern. And everybody who demonstrates against them is not just demonstrating against policies or governance, they are demonstrating against the state and are thereby enemies of the state, if you want. So there is a lot, I think we, we sometimes, because at this particular truth for the media, they have such a soft spot for the left that they very often overlook the kind of authoritarian language that comes out of the left. I think I find this always kind of kind of a little bit befuddling. But the broader issue is. At this point, I think it really doesn't matter anymore whether these protests are right wing or left wing, because if you would ask the farmers in the Netherlands, the farmers in Poland, I think the answer they would give you is we protest about very specific issues that are neither right nor left. But they have become the tip of the spear, if you want, for a right wing movement. And the reason for this, I believe, is because food Farming, agriculture is something that people can relate to. So this is a very effective thing and the right wants to use it. And to be quite honest, I wish them the best of success with it. But as we said at the beginning of today's show, it might have started with the farming issue, but I think it is growing into something bigger because there is a widespread dissatisfaction, especially with EU institutions, but also with local institutions. And you said this quite correctly early on, right? There is a significant number of people who feel they don't have a voice. And now they feel that the farmers can be a megaphone, right? To say things that the farmers themselves might not even want to talk about, but they can serve as a megaphone for broader issues. And I think that is necessary. The democratic process lives from the inclusion of everything that worries the people and not just the issues of a small segment of, you know, center left or far left politicians. Well, that to zadam jeszcze jedno pytanie wynikające z tego, co powiedziałeś. Jak to się stało, że przeszliśmy drogę od europejskiej wspólnoty węgla i stali, od której Europa się zaczęła? do miejsca, w którym dyskutujemy, czy Europa w ogóle ma produkować żywność. Cóż takiego się stało? Przecież to jest czyste szaleństwo. Well, I think, you know, everybody always talks negatively about Francis Fukuyama's end of history, but the Europeans behave as if the end of history has happened. Look at some of the major issues, exactly what you mentioned, that we are dealing with. We can no longer solve the big problems, so we have all these luxury problems. Like, as you say, how much meat should you eat? Should you drink milk? Is cheese really good for you? Uh, how many genders are there? I mean, these are all problems that we can talk about in times of peace and prosperity, but if we 
you look what's currently happening in the world, somebody should stand up, and I hope this is going to be a consequence of this, and say, okay, this was a lot of fun in the 1990s where we had the time and, and patience for that, but now we actually have to focus on, re on real issues. And again, Poland is not affected by this because your economy is doing really well, but the Polish economy alone cannot shoulder Europe. So what's going on in Germany, the deindustrialization de because of these ideological reasons is going to be a problem for Europe, right? And we all know, I don't have to tell you this, and I don't have to tell your Polish viewers and listen to this, if Germany is descending into chaos, usually what comes out of it is not good for anybody. And I think that that's, problem that's, or that that's risk is still there. That's absolutely true. And tak, to, to prawda. To, co martwi mnie i myślę, że martwi wielu ludzi na świecie, to pytanie o powody, dla których Europa popełnia takie spektakularne, ekonomiczne, gospodarcze samobójstwo. Europa, kontynent, na której zbudowana została zachodnia cywilizacja, której wszyscy jesteśmy częścią, to, to pytanie, które będziemy z pewnością zadawać również następnym razem, kiedy Ralf będzie z nami. Bardzo dziękuję za to spotkanie w telewizji Republika. Dziękuję bardzo za Telewizja Republika. Dziękuję bardzo za having me. See you soon.